Before we begin, can I confirm that our speaker, Mr. Ankit, are you here with us today? Yeah, hi, I am. Right, thank you very much. So we'll begin the session. Distinguished colleagues, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the interactive session on our agenda item today. So today with us today, we have Mr. Ankit Mahotra, who is an expert on the agenda item, and he will be making a statement on the importance of the topic which has been allocated to our Peace Building Council. So after he finishes his presentation, the floor will be open to the delegations for comment and question. So please prepare any question if you have them beforehand. I would like to introduce Mr. Ankit Mahotra briefly. So Mr. Ankit Mahotra has a Bachelor of Arts degree in International Relations from the Jindal School of International Affairs. During his bachelor studies, he worked with late professor Dr. Nenkin Pao Kipchen and also read a co-authored paper on the India-China rivalry in South Asia, where he served as the youngest speaker at the 26th International Political Science Association World Congress in July earlier this year. He also co-founded the Jindal Society of International Law, which was launched on the 18th November 2020 by Herbert and Rose Rubin, Professor of International Law, Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, along with the Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar, Professor Dr. Veselin Popovsky, and Dr. Mohan Kumar. So under his leadership, the society has hosted international speakers from renowned foreign universities, member of International Law Commission, international law firms, United Nations, World Bank, and Hague Academy of International Law. Since its inception, the society has held 70 online lectures under his leadership and was awarded the most active society New Student Initiative on University Day 2021. So we are very proud and we are very thankful that Dr. Ankit can join us today. So Dr. Ankit, the floor is yours. Well, let me first of all, thank you for the honorary doctorate you've given me. I'm still a student like those over here in this room. Uh, I've also prepared a small presentation, which I'd uh, like to share on the screen. I've got two systems, so I, I hope I'll be able to manage that. Uh, can can you please confirm if this is visible? Yes, it is visible. All right, thank you. Uh, so let me begin by thanking the speakers for giving me this opportunity to share and present on a topic which I have studied but not studied at length. But this project, this undertaking gave me the opportunity to do that. Uh, as, as, as your vice president very rightly said, uh, I represent the Jindal School of uh, International Affairs, the Jindal Global Law School, and the Jindal Society of International Law. I am also a research assistant under the expert tutelage of Professor Dr. Weston Popowski, who I assume has also spoken and on in this uh, platform. What I have designed for for the next fifteen minutes in the uh, uh, for following question and answer session is 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 an introduction to peace building, natural resource management, and climate related security risk study. We then discuss and understand climate related security risks. We then see what are the responses to these challenges. We then look at the meat of the matter which I have been asked to prepare on, which is towards an integrated report or an approach to, to, to these challenges. We then end with a summary or reflections, which I will leave open ended and hope that there will be a discussion on those fronts. In the introduction, I've shared a quote which resonate, resonates with the feelings which I want to share and express through this presentation. But in the introductory part, let me also share that humans and human societies are dependent on nature. All aspects of human life originate in nature, be it food, water, energy, or shelter. Human lives substantially different from environmental and climatic conditions are affected diversely. Droughts and heavy precipitation, wildflowers and 
and such events influence this to a degree and extent which is unmatchable. We are witnessing today a climate change in both magnitude and speed of transformation as human activities also shelter and alter the Earth's climate. This lies behind the assertion that we have entered a new era, an era of Anthropocene. This is not only affecting all the types of changes already experienced in nature, but involves new features such as increased level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and oceans and unprecedented level of sea level rise. Given the alterations in the Earth's climate systems, the fundamental impacts that will follow the biosphere and human societies, climate change is increasingly becoming treated as a security risk. Its diverse impacts mean the security risks might follow on climate change but differ in climate change studies. An important aspect of the magnum opus in this is the IPCC and the reports that it generates. In my studies, in preparation for this presentation, security risks, I've learned that security risks posed by climate change and the response to these risks vary on the organization which you discuss. The overall aim is to provide a practical alternative on how to address and work with climate related security studies. To do so, I will first analyze the diversity of the security risks posed by climate change in order to consolidate the knowledge of these risks. Second, by investigating how policymakers and practitioners integrate these risks into the policies and practical frameworks. Without wasting any further time, let me share concerns which I would like to highlight to specifically deal with climate change and the challenges which we need to address as a collective. First being sea level rise and coastal degradation. Given the slow onset of sea level rise and the lack of historical equivalent events, sea level rise is an illustrative example of a field where the past may have low explanatory values when asserting security impacts and how to tackle this. The trajectory is well known as much as 70% of the world's coastline is expected to experience sea level rise, but the impact of this rise will differ substantially across regions. In general, these differences reflect different countries, different regions' capacities to invest and investigate this further and protect and adapt systems to tackle this. Sea level rise increases the impacts of storms, floods, damages to infrastructure, degradation of coastal areas. Rising sea levels could also have disruptive impact on livelihoods in low-lying low coastal areas such as the Pacific region, such as Maldives, whose, ex whose very existence is now threatened. Cities like mine, Mumbai, Changu, Manila, Karachi, but also countries, cities power cities like Miami, New York will also be affected. In essence, both cities are also identified as particularly vulnerable for adverse impacts on sea level rise and possible increased storm frequency on maritime transportation, hence on trade routes as well. The importance, dear friends, of integrating climate change adaption and disaster risk management is evident for many coastal regions and areas since they are both long-term challenges because of sea level rise and rapid onset of disasters due to extreme weather events. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which defines the boundaries of national territorial waters, has not yet taken into account changing coastlines. The existence of robust systems for settling disputes between countries is therefore considered for preventing tensions between conflicting nation party states. In order to promote resilient communities in a context of rising sea levels, it must be emphasized the importance of reducing vulnerability of affected areas of pollution by, for instance, stronger security schemes, investment in new economic activities, improving local livelihoods, and strengthening the resilience of infrastructure are key. Need I point to any further than the extremely erudite address of the later leader of Barbados during the ongoing COP26, where she illustrates and explains these, these thematic issues in real politics 
and economic values. Let us also look at extreme weather events and weather-related disasters. The IPCC report on extreme weather events and disasters concluded that changing climate is leading in the frequency of in intensity, spatial extent, duration, and timing weather and climate events and can result in unprecedented extreme weather climate conditions. There's already vulnerable populations which should be affected. Scholars generally distinguish between slow ones and disasters and sudden shocks. But let us study the case of water scarcity. Extreme weather events have found to be both exacerbated existing violent conflicts and foster peace or de-escalation. This highlights how the grievances can deepen in the aftermath of natural disasters. Because of the disaster itself, how governments distribute relief measurements and humanitarian assistance to the populations. In general, disaster management needs to move beyond the construction of defensive infrastructure to improve societal preparedness and prevention capacities. It must be noted that disaster management is effective and cooperative. It can only provide an opportunity for peace by fostering solidarity, cooperation, and building deep-rooted political uh, bridges and to destroy the cleavages which exist in society. The most pernicious out of these is climate-related migration. Climate-related migration, as, as what U.S. Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights was, is climate-related poverty and climate apartheid. This is Philip Alston, who is the Special Rapporteur. He claims that the hundreds and millions of persons will, food, fa will face food insecurity, forced migration, disease and death. It is also important to juxtapose these various fields with other disciplines of not only law, but also international relations. Migration caused by climatic change is frequently mentioned in the policy literature on climate change, but it's also an important issue which is heavily contested. That is because the IPCC report contends that some migration flows are sensitive to change in resource availability and the ecosystems and the services they provide. Major extreme weather events have in the past led to population displacement and changes in the incidence of extreme events will amplify these changes further on. The IPCC report concludes that climate change will have significant impact on forms of migration that compromise human security. There is an excellent report which The Economist has published on this very issue where it studies this impact in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Migration is often described in relation to different forms of patterns, international versus national, permanent, circular or temporary, and voluntary versus forced. Climate change and climate vulnerability seem to affect these patterns in different ways completely. Extreme weather events can influence permanent migrations. Locations at high risk of extreme weather events could eventually be partly or entirely abandoned which could exacerbate the large migration movements that would move already taking place, a migration from rural to urban areas. While it is possible to identify forms of migration patterns relating to different climate impacts, it is not possible to make predictions from one specific form of altered climate conditions about the character or level of migration movements. This is due to the web of interacting factors that need to be taken into account considering the explanatory migratory movement of persons. This has worsened due to environmental or climatic conditions. One way or the other, migration and livelihood are interlinked. There are areas, there are chambers and silos described as trapped pollutions, often in the poorest and poorest of regions, with the slow onset and rapid onset of disasters and humanitarian catastrophes. Large scale, particularly unpaneled migratory movements certainly affect societies, including wealthy and stable societies. From a security point of view, it is primarily the migrants who face security challenges. Note that the rapid challenges in the societal systems can increase tensions and inequalities which have existed in society. How do we respond as a collective to these challenges? Our forefathers have laid down institutions. 
which bridge the values that exist in our nations. These institutions such as the United Nations, European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the African Union, the ASEAN, and the ILK can incorporate climate-related security risk challenges. These are multifaceted risk challenges. The overriding challenge, however, is to overcome the silos that exist between different political communities. To probe more into this heavily practical alternatives for accomplishing such works and contribute cons concrete experiences of how organizations address climate change is important. To this front and to these international organizations, I like to refer to as domesticated internationalism, which essentially means one voice of a region on a global scale. However, addressing climate change for many organizations in itself is a challenge. One way of grasping the complex linkages between climate-related change and security is to break the implications down into different policy areas such as defense, foreign affairs, crisis management and development. At the same time, however, due to the interplay between these different thematic areas, integrated responses between various policy fields are also extremely crucial. This involves, for instance, the integration of disaster risk reduction, climatic change adaptation, the involvement of local vulnerabilities and adaptation in capacity of security alliances and analysis, and integration of climate change into peace building processes. Hence, to address the multifaceted security risks posed by climate change, organizations must address the issues that go beyond their traditional list of issues. Since security as a concept is strongly associated with hard security and a military response, many researchers, in my reading, are skeptical about the engagement of hard security military alliances towards climate change. Towards an integrated approach and conflict risks by national development organizations. This is further divided as I will proceed and forms the heart of the presentation which I have been asked to prepare on or offers an excellent trailer to what I would like to expand upon in the upcoming part which addresses the question squarely. There is a growing consensus among the parties and practitioners and scholars that combine climate, conflict and fragility risk required to integrate and have a cohesive approach. Development organizations have often resultantly and recently started to integrate security implications and climate change into high-level policies. However, the translation of high-level policies into geographical strategies and programming has often proved challenging for nations and developing nations especially. In this section, let me, let me follow and form the integrations approaches identified in the literatures which I have read on. Addressing combined climate and conflict risk studies, the integration of climate risks to peace building efforts and the need to apply conflict sensitive approach in climate change programs. This is often called as climate resilient peace building and conflict sensitive climate change programming in the literature that I have come across. Climate resilient peace building in its core offers both to take short term and long term climate risks into consideration as potential drivers of conflict. In addition to prevent the emergence of new tensions or intensification of ongoing conflicts, it is important to work proactively to assert potential risks and to adopt necessary mitigation and or adaptive measures. Climate proofing as a strategy of integration. Climate proofing, dear friends, has a twofold aim. Aimed at assessing the extent to which a policy or programming is exposed to risks associated with climate change or vulnerability and variability of the extent to which the program itself could increase vulnerability to climate change. Criminalization rather than scrutinization. This is important. This is important from a legal aspect as well. That is because to achieve policy coherence or climate security, it might not be the result of just institution barriers or a lack of resources, but also 
of a conflict guiding principle and to deliberate efforts to keep climate action and development separate from security domains. For an example, consider in contrast to the EU's security and defense policies. Humanitarian aid is based on the need and is much less politicized. Thus, responding to climate-related security risks requires sensitivity to the, de to, the de to the delicate ties between political, economic, or military goals to avoid compromising the underlying principles of impartiality, neutrality, that are central to aid. Improving coordination policy across the areas is also extremely important. A general conclusion can be drawn from the analysis that I have shared is that strategic guidance is crucial to achieve coordination between policy areas. Not least due to the conceptual confusion that has emerged in the absence of strategies. With actors referring to fragility, resilience, comprehensive security, strategic interest, and not necessarily with any clear understanding of the interplay between them. Achieving an integrated approach does not mean that all actors involved in climate change should start analyzing its national and international security implications. With these words, let me share the integrated approach which I have asked to prepare and share my opinion on. The first part of this is, as you see on your screens, managing climate related security studies. But how do you do this? And what does this mean? The multifaceted character of climate change related security studies highlights the need to pay attention to the approaches taken in the analysis and how to affect the outcome. Moreover, this multifaceted approach and character also means to take the risks, risks that are relevant to a diverse range of actors mandated to an area of expertise. Climate-related security risks are addressed and will continue to be addressed in numerous ways. Nevertheless, since many of these security risks are also linked to each other, a bridge is needed between the different ways and approaches. Responses in one area can also affect the other areas. Take, for instance, the response to, power, to, to properly uh, vitiate climate-related security risks. We need to address this interplay between the security measures taken to reduce the insecurities. This lies behind the choice of risks-based approach, recognizing this multifaceted and multidimensional character of climate risks. It calls for an integrated approach as a way to respond to these challenges. Identify common conceptual frameworks and reconciling different discourses. On a thematic level, this is extremely important. That is because one partial explanation for this could be that security is often linked to threats rather than risks. It is often accompanied by what is called as a military response, as I have highlighted earlier. This emerges from human security, but also recognizes other security dimensions such as communal security, state security, and the international security, and what they are interrelatedly known as. Climate change undermines human livelihood and well-being, affects the drivers of violent conflict, and alters territories. Nonetheless, since security can be analyzed from different angles and through different time frames, it is crucial to link the measures suggested with their impacts on other dimensions of security. Within, the, within and between generations of this principle, a general understanding for selecting measures ought to be that they are not carried out at the cost of increased human insecurity. Relevance of talking about security risks in relation to climate change, as we have seen, is also important and relevant to explore other conceptual frameworks used to strengthen the analysis and policy responses. Development of organizational structures to strengthen coordination. This is extremely important because our international organizations represent us, the voices which are so close to us and which we cherish as open democratic societies. Climate risks and securities thereof in the form of development, foreign policy, disaster reduction strategies and securities, and the cross-sectional impact of their characters combined with the lack of conceptual coherence 
on how to frame these impacts is extremely important and crucial, which must require further study. For political leadership and statesmen are required to overcome policy silos, should play an important role in an integrated approach for the international organizations to function smoothly, effectively, and efficiently. Lack of incentives and the resources to change their normal procedures of operations are also extremely important. This is perhaps one of the biggest pitfalls of climate change related studies. There is no GDP or X net result which you will gain from protecting the climate. However, we as a society, as a generation, have an intergenerational and intragenerational responsibility to leave the environment as we found it. Not better, well, hopefully better, but certainly not worse. I now speak about the enhancement systematic levels of knowledge and how this can be useful. The gaps between research and practice need to be reduced. Secondly, there needs to be a bridge between short-term and long-term frameworks of study. Thirdly, the dynamic character of climate-related security risk means that knowledge acquisition is an ongoing process that spans all kinds of disciplinary boundaries and policy areas. I strongly encourage everyone over here to study NDCs, nationally determined, determined contributions of each nations. These are issues, these are live issues, these are issues which are discussed in the ongoing COP26 and are of extreme relevance to us and to the future generations which have not seen the light of day. With those words, I thank you for your kind attention and I shall now open up for questions. Thank you. All right, so I would like to thank Mr. Ankit very much for his insightful speech. So I believe that the speech that you have just given will help us with our future session. So for now, if there are any delegates who wish to ask any question to our speaker, please raise your hand on Zoom and I will approach you one by one. Delegate of UK, please. Uh, thank you for the insightful speech you provided. Uh, just a question, would a holistic and pragmatic resource management system help? I uh, see four hands are raised, please. Uh, uh, we can have Andy Lee first. That's the first name I see on my screen. Thank you very much for your speech. I really appreciated your time. Um, I was. I just... can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, hello. Can you hear me now? Hello. Can Can anyone else hear me? I'm sorry. I still can't hear you on my system. Yes, you are audible. Uh. Mr. Ankit, I think you might need to turn up your volume. Yeah, please, please. Hello, can you hear me now, Mr. Ankit? Yes, yes, okay, I can. Perfect. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time, and it was a really insightful speech. Um, I was just wondering if you had any tangible solutions that you were that you would suggest for developed nations to assist developing nations with response with responding to these climate related risks? Um, and like, would this include aid in moving towards green energy? Um, or how would you suggest developed nations aiding? Well, you strike right at the heart of the presentation. My, my studies, my studies as a student of international law have propelled me to study this concept, which was framed during the discussions of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And your accent is that of a person from Singapore. There's a very famous Singapore negotiator, his name is Tommy Ko. Tommy Ko played an instrumental role in creating the Convention on the Law of the Sea. He was also foreign minister for, for, for Singapore. And he said that the convention is like a sword and a shield. And what does he mean by that? He means that the convention can be used to protect and also to harm those, harm those in the sense, enforce rights in regions which are contested. What, why this is important is because his colleagues worked on a concept known as the common heritage of mankind. 
the oceans beyond 200 nautical miles and that of whoever feels free, feels free to lay a claim on them. Common heritage of mankind coupled with common but differentiated responsibility which was enshrined during the 1972 Stockholm Declaration are extremely important actors and lenses which I encourage everyone to, to refer to. That is because they create the conceptual frameworks for you to understand. In my personal opinion, it is wishful thinking for you to hope that a first world nation will come to you or will come to your assistance. What I personally feel is it is the onus upon each nation to do whatever it is in their boundaries to do whatever and however they can do to achieve the national targets, to achieve international targets as well. 1.5 is what we agreed in Paris in 2015. How you would reach there is a determination which you must make. Perhaps that is why it is sold as the nationally determinated uh, contribution. What I would also suggest and argue is work in regional organizations ASEAN, the African Union, the Latin American states, organizations such as these, in my opinion, is where the answers lie. Because they understand one another, and to a very large extent they have a common historical lineage. The answers lie within us, and the activism lies further deeper within us. There remains a need of activism, nonetheless. The activism lies in the generations which are younger to mine and yours. It is unfortunate that the mantle of change has been taken upon them and by them. But in the name of protection and safety, someone has to. Thank you very much. Next delegate of Nigeria, you may ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ankit. Uh, my question is, so as we are currently speaking, there is an ongoing um, uh, COP26 climate change conference, uh, conference today and for the next few days. And uh, several major powers, including uh, USA, China, as well as Japan, have not signed uh, this pledge. So uh, even though uh, your work is within international law and um, well, treaties uh, that are not signed will not be binding, uh, uh, should there be any uh, decisive measures against nations that cannot adhere to decarbonize or refuse uh, to sign such ple pledges? And if so, what kind of uh, effective measures uh, would you propose? Thank you. Well, thank you for this question. Uh, I am in agreement with you because I also feel that penal measures, not only penal measures, but criminal measures must be attached to those perpetrators who are responsible for these changes and also responsible for, for improving the situation for us heading towards a four, four degree Celsius hotter climate or a hotter weather situation. But that being said, let me point towards this as a legal uh, student, COP26, and the Paris Agreement, specifically with respect to the Paris Agreement, to come out of it at what the previous government did was not done at that very moment. As soon as the present government came to power, the Biden administration, it put the US back into the framework and has to abide by that. Other countries were also mentioned. China is taking a very strong hold in trying to improve measures it has said that it will go carbon net zero by 2060. These are declarations which states are making. However, there is also an independent panel report which has created the sixth or, or, or another level of, of penal consequences for the, for the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute creates the International Criminal Court in the late 90s. There is now ecocide Ecocide punishes those who are responsible for wanted damages to the climate. There are now vast measures being adopted. Before this session last last a fortnight ago, I had the pleasure of speaking to Christina Watt, who played an instrumental role in creating Ecocide. She is, as we speak, in COP26 in Glasgow. And she remained strongly in favor of states working together and coming to the coming to the table for a solution 
Let me also share what once was once told to me by Professor Popowski. He was asked that what does the United Nations bring to the table? He said, well, the table, the United Nations and such forums are places where states come and negotiate. The situation now is as such that negotiations must result in active and quick solutions. The challenges are in front of us, but change needs to happen now. And to this front, let me encourage you to read Edith Brown Weiss's instrumental work on intergenerational equity to keep the planet as we found it for those who are not even born yet. This is a burden, this is a moral, ethical burden which must rest on our shoulders for us to preserve the only planet we have. Thank you for your answer. Next up, can we have the question from Pakistan, please? Thank you for your speech. This is kind of tangent to your presentation. Uh, my question is that like, even though there's apparent climate related security risks, there's a growing sentiment that climate change is a hoax. Even in like member states that have literacy rate close to 100%, as having them potentially delay the actions towards climate change, like we saw during Donald Trump's America, what kind of solutions do you think will resolve the situation? Well, in a concoction of, of politics, science, and economics, this was bound to happen. Mm -hmm. You must understand, you must understand and remember that each country adopts and looks at challenges differently. As you very rightly pointed it out, the United States of America will look at it as an economic problem. The European states will look at it as a political problem because they need to reach a consensus. The EU needs a consensus as a voice collectively. But here lies the catch with the European Union. They will reach a consensus. They will be leaders in this. However, for Asian states like yours and mine, for us, it will be an ecological debt that the first world states owe us. And that is the point where the discussion becomes extremely and acutely political. This is not a political discussion. This is a discussion for the livelihood of those who are not even born yet. We must separate the politics and the science and look at them separately. Political actions and political statements are made, but they're flawed. What Trump said all those years ago was not even true politically, or factually, or even legally. So there's not much weight attached to that. But there is merit attached to it, because that influences the perception and thoughts of persons. But this changes very quickly when things start happening in their own backyard. And climate change, like a pandemic, is not, is not like a crash on the Wall Street. The Wall Street did not affect your nation and my nation as it affected Western European nations. However, climate change and a global pandemic has affected all our lives. This discussion is happening over a, over a platform which was created in the pandemic. So much else has happened in the pandemic. Possibilities have, have become means on which we survive. However, with climate change, the consequences are unknown and that we as a generation must fear. Thank you very much. Um, if the delegates have already asked the question, please lower your hand in Zoom so I don't get confused. I think up next we have Costa Rica. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, delegate of Costa Rica uh, would like to ask um, uh, Mr. Ankit uh, the, the opinion regarding the current situation that many countries uh, they put their more uh, their attention to the modernization of its own states. For example, like making a building a modern uh, city and improving the technology and else. Like for example. Uh, from the news that I have read that uh, Kuwait, uh, it's 
is trying to build like a modern city by 2035. But until now, no, no, uh, the, uh, Kuwait uh, not yet uh, has a plan for joining other countries to as a carbon neutral countries by 2050. What do you think like about this? Do you do you think modernization is should be like the main focus for every countries, especially like this current time, you know, many global warming and high climate change and else? That's all for my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Costa Rica is home to the United Nations University. Thoughts in universities are crucial. Thoughts coming from universities are crucial. Let your university not become a firebrand as so many other universities have become across the Western world. What the pandemic has taught us is to reimagine and rethink everything, especially with architecture and spaces. What the Kuwaiti imagination is, I confess I have very little knowledge about it, but what I can share positively and faithfully is that it will take into account measures which are green, which are renewable, which are sustainable, because sustainability is key. And sustainability and modernization must not again be looked at as a loss of one and another. That being said, modernization must not stop. For third world countries, modernization is key. And perhaps this is where first world countries might assist. And international organizations like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund must play their role in helping institution building. Let me also share that India lost as much as the United States lost in the fall of Kabul. India literally invested in Afghanistan. It built Afghanistan's parliament. An investment in a political system is key. An investment sustainable methods is even more key. But if you ask an architect, the paradigm and the dilemma which he faces is in order to prove himself, he must build again. So where lies the sustainability then? Where lies this question? Because you are exhausting resources by building again just to prove a point of sustainability. These are important discourses which have sprung in the pandemic which you must ponder upon. Peace building in itself is a framework which you must study, as I hope you do, in this curriculum and also generally. Architecture and other means will develop in a greener way, hopefully in the near future and with better technologies. Thank you again for your insightful answer. So next up, I would like to welcome Delegate of Kenya, which will be followed by Peru. Thank you very much. Um, my question is what negotiation and diplomatic tactics and tools have you developed throughout your career that you believe are particularly useful in um, model United Nations simulations? Um, and that question is particularly in the context where states that aren't meeting their uh, previous climate agreements um, are refusing to sort of change their stance. Well, I must share with you, I have no experience. I'm still a student. I'm still studying the law. And, but I have had experience of hearing firsthand views on creation of treaties and, 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 and conventions. You'll be surprised to know that states function in absurd ways. You would have never imagined an agreement or, or, or a caucus headed by Iceland and India. But it happens. Why does it happen? It happens because they are literally sitting next to each other in the United Nations. And hungry to the myths, states function in different ways. But there remains a common denominator national sovereignty and interests. Each state must protect its sovereignty at whatever cost. But once you come to an international organization, you must shed the cloak of sovereignty. Only then will you be able to achieve, achieve solutions which are sustainable for all. States have over time functioned in blocks and they will continue to function 
in blocks for the near future. This has been most relevant and also seen most recently by myself in the election of the latest judge for the International Court of Justice, this is Hillary Charlesworth of Australia. Look at the nations which support her. Look at the nations who support her fellow candidate. You will very, very easily see where the trust lies of states and nations. You cannot separate the politics from the reality. Negotiations are influenced by a lot of factors, but sovereignty, I repeat, remains key and integral to this discussion. But that being said, don't discount the fact that small nation states or nation states which you might feel are insignificant cannot do much. And this is a common misconception that only the United States of America creates laws. No, that's wrong. I encourage you to read international legal scholars like R.P. Anand, who speak about the creation of international law before the European models as we know them now. International law is older than the European models. In fact, it is older than European nations themselves. I mentioned the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and common heritage of mankind. The concept of common heritage of mankind was propounded by a, by a negotiator or a, a representative for Malta. Malta is a small island in the Mediterranean, but it was able to garner support and traction on views which have transformed thinking completely. States can negotiate for the betterment of not only themselves, but also others. But what remains key and instrumental in that is to be able to come to the table, talk, and most importantly, listen, not just hear. Thank you again. Karu, you may begin. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for your insight. You mentioned uh, in your presentation the engagement of military and hard power and the issues that can arise with this. My question is how the UN can best balance its obligations as to peacekeeping operations, which themselves often contribute significantly to carbon emissions and its obligations uh, pursuant to its sustainable development goals under the climate neutral strategy of becoming completely carbon neutral. Well, thank you for your question. Before I answer it, let me share that I was speaking to a fellow Peruvian just yesterday. This is Monica Fiera Tinta. She's a barrister in 20 Essex Court in England. And we were discussing this, but not exactly in this light. She was speaking about international organizations and the immunities which they have. You hint towards it, but let me address the question which you asked on U.S. peacekeeping operations. The U.N. peacekeeping operations is a different species altogether. What you need are institutions which are focused and which are more penetrative in their approach when it comes to the issues which we, had, which we have discussed throughout the presentation. Peace building operations have a different mandate altogether. Their mandate is to build institutions. Their mandate is to improve the situation and perhaps and at all costs avoid a situation like a Haiti. And also, they must not never abuse the powers which they have in their arsenal and armor because that, that reduces their credibility to an extent which is unimaginable. Right, thank you again. I believe the UK question was skipped at the start. Do you still want to ask the question, the United Kingdom? If not, we will have four quick questions due to time constraints. So I would like to invite uh, St. Vincent to ask the question, please. And then we will cover three more questions briefly so we didn't exceed the time with Mr. Ankit. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask, the delegate of St. Vincent and the Grenadines would like to ask about that. Mm, from, the, from the current situations, to what extent would you think the, the oligopolies such as the GAFAMs the Tesla and Tesla and so on, how could they contribute to the climate change and peace building security related issues according to according to the situation now? Thank you. 
Well, thank you for your question. You represent a country which is integral and instrumental to the situation of climate change because your livelihood is at stake. But to answer the question which you've posed on Tesla and these, these new forms of energy, in my opinion, these are dreams, these are dreams which should become reality as soon as possible, but can't. In a country like India, we are 18% of the entire world's population. To imagine and have green solutions is a far-fetched dream. You need, you need solutions which will work for countries, which will have specific goals directed towards them. Green and renewable energies are solutions. These must be furthered, but they must be domesticated. In my opinion, oligopolies, especially American oligopolies, must come to the table and speak to organizations to understand their approach and how the solutions which they have can be best implemented. You can't fit a round peg in a square hole. If that is what, if that is what, if the steps which I suggest are not mentioned or are not further thought upon, then that is what will happen. A Tesla cannot survive in India. The infrastructure still doesn't exist. There is a lacuna which exists in the imagination and the practice, which is what I also tried to highlight in the presentation which I created. Thank you. Next up, we will have the United Kingdom, which will be followed by France. The UK, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is just in regard, would an organization that manages resource, that looks at resources in a holistic and pragmatic way be effective in ensuring that resources are not the main pr uh, source of conflicts in the future? Well, resources are the source of conflict. Look no further than South Asia and recollect what George Bush once very famously said. He said this in the context of India. He said that Kashmir, which is a disputed territory, which as you as a British delegate would know best about, is the world's most dangerous spot. You see flashpoints in the South China Sea as well. You see this working out vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan as well. The war for resources has continued since the end of the Cold War and has no end to it. New conflicts have stopped, but existing conflicts have, have continued all in the name of resources. And the scramble for Africa continues Look at the advances China has made in Africa, piercing through in the name of cobalt and other resources. Cobalt, dear friends, powers the mobile phones which you use. Look at the diamond industry. The diamond industry strives in these regions of Africa. There was an excellent article in the Times magazine a couple of years ago. It spoke about the it speaks about the exploitation of resources in Africa. Resource wars will continue until and unless the greed has been satisfied. The greed knows no bounds. So where will this stop? Look at Russia. Look at the Russian advancements and how the, the, the Nord Stream is now used as a tool for political arm twisting. Vestiges and fragments of resource wars continue and will continue until and unless goals of a larger scale are not realized and collectively imagined to have solutions for. Next, I would like to invite France and we will end the session with the last question from Timor Les. So France, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ankit, like a very uh, inspirational uh, speech. Um, I'd like to know that, like, as you mentioned, how the agenda of the resolution of climate change is affected by politics and economics. But uh, do you think what is, uh, what is the most important motivation for the states to set aside those political and, and economic like, benefits to really focus on the 
resolution of climate change, like from a very scientific um, perspective? Well, the simple answer is survival. You as France should realize that your former colonies are also satellites for you. Satellites are only for you, but for the entire EU. You provide as EU benefits to them, citizenship to them, currency to them. There was a famous case which is just included in the, uh, well, an advisory opinion was asked for the, from the ICJ on the status of the Marshall Islands. Are these colonies or not? Was asked. Why? Because the Americans and the British said that these are colonies which we use, these are satellites and military standpoints which we use, which are our domain. We use these to protect the Indian Ocean. That's one aspect of it, military aspect, financial aspect. Once the empire ended, yours in the British Empire has ended, a new empire was created. Island nation states like Timor Leste, St. Grenadines, Bahamas, uh, all British overseas territories became financial hubs. This was the neo colonial empire. You can also look at places like Malta. You can also look at other places in the Mediterranean Sea, which are extremely important for this purpose. Investigative reports have time and again highlighted how money is stashed over there. Why I am highlighting this is to highlight and underscore the importance attached to these regions. What happens to these regions once they no longer exist? What happens to the situation? What, what is the situation that exists for the persons in these regions? Where do they go? Where do they come? Can Europe, can France, can the UK, which has closed its borders now in the name of Brexit, afford another migration influx? Will Germany be open as it was? Does it still feel the guilt? Or will it adopt a Hungarian approach and close its borders? Also remember that borders are often romanticized. The Great Wall of China the Great Wall of China was built to protect the hordes from, from the Mongols, from the Genghis Khan's and, and vast empire. Why I'm highlighting this is because to highlight the importance which exists in history. History can be studied in different sense and perspectives. But what remains important is to come to the table and forget these differences. There, in my personal opinion, should not be an ecological debt. There is only one debt which we owe to those who don't even exist, is to provide a world which is as good or, if possible, a better one to the one which we entered and lived in. As things stand, that seems like a dream and not a reality, and that leaves me bereft. Thank you so much for your answer. So last but not least, we will end the Q&A session with Timar last question. Um, thank you for your very informative speech. I have a quick question that since um, in renewable energy is very popular among those developed countries, but for Timor Leste, this kind of uh, poor and underdeveloped countries, we don't have the money and technology to develop such green energy. So I'm just, I just want to ask, is there any kind of program that can help us? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Honestly speaking, I don't know. I say so because there remains no solution to this. What happens to small island nation states? What happens to third world developing states? What happens to states like Ethiopia? What happens to states like Sudan? They've not even been vaccinated. Vaccinations themselves, the the permit, the 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 permission to 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 manufacture these, the agreements, the the the, the trademark agreements to publish, have not been given. Institutions like the World Trade Organization are in flux because the Europeans don't want to share this. 
Well, that's just one perspective of it, that the Europeans don't want to share it. That is the reality. You can't, you, you can either admit it, move on and look for solutions collectively, or you can lament about that fact. Scholarship, unfortunately, laments about the fact that they won't want to share it. As a practical solution, you have to look for something. The answer for, for a country like Timor Leste lies with its neighboring brothers and sisters, with the small island nation states. Don't forget that the small island nation states have also played an instrumental role in creating the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Convention on the Law of the Sea is also touted as a, as a, as a developing nation states uh, uh, production or a, or a repatriation of their thoughts and opinions. But to answer your question more squarely, you must look at alliance building because these are solutions which require alliance building. You must look at geographical hotspots and think about this logically. What the Marshall Islands, well, sorry, what the Chagas Archipelago and the Diego Garcias of the world must do is admit the fact that they are former colonies. Is admit that their regions are used as, as, as military bases. But use that as an advantage. Use that as a chipping block. Use that as a key card for negotiation, negotiating with the G7. If not, then you have the ability to pull the card or pull the plug. And then what? It hurts them then. What I am trying to share with you is a dexterous and a Machiavellian idea. You must hit them where it hurts. And you must utilize the cards which are close to you for your own betterment. Timor Leste and small island nation states also play a very important role. You can also include countries like Australia in this. I encourage you to look at the international map of submarine cables. Submarine cables carry our internet signals. This call is possible because of that. It is on satellites in the sky who can carry our internet signals. I urge you all to look at submarine cables and how vast that map is. In fact, let me let me just share it because I find this extremely interesting. It shows you how important submarine cables are in the 21st century. It also shows you if one cable gets cut off or is severed, how big the impact will be on all of us and how one nation can stop. And if nations stop, imagine the economic catastrophe that would cause to all of us in this room. Because money moves through cables, money moves through the internet. It is no longer sent in other modes and mediums. I'll share this and I'll make the point and then if there are any follow-ups, I'll be happy to take them. But I find this extremely interesting. This is what the world map looks like. These are all submarine cables, dear friends. This is India. Imagine if, imagine if flag gets severed. <coughs> imagine if flag is severed. What are the economic consequences of that? There are countries like Malta and you'll not believe this. They actually tax, they actually tax the cables which come to their region. It's an international tax which exists. Egypt allows you to do that. You cannot pass the Swiss Canal without paying a tax to the Egyptian government. These are important tools which states have in their arsenals. And these arsenals are extremely relevant and important. Imagine, just imagine if this cable is severed from India over here in Bombay. The Far East is lost. It will be dark quite literally dark, you'll lose all access to internet. If there are any follow-ups and submarine cables, I'll be happy to answer it. Let me share that submarine cables were severed during the Cold War. Russia was, the USSR was responsible for that. The United States was also responsible for it. Submarine cables have existed for 200 years and also are protected under international law and have one of the oldest conventions which protect it. It is also protected under the Convention on the Law of the Sea. But imagine the catastrophe that will take place financially 
what would be the consequences for a Lehman, well, well, for a for a Goldman Sachs, who moved three trillion dollars a single day, and most of it is done through Hong Kong, through Singapore, and these hubs which exist in South Asia. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ankit. So you had given us a very informative one hour session, both your presentation and the Q&A session. I would like to thank you again, and I hope that the delegates can use the knowledge that you have given and incorporated it into their future session. So thank you very much. But we- thank, yeah. thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it, was, it was a pleasure presenting this before you. I have also learned whilst preparing for this, and I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this interesting topic. And uh, I can stay in the room for a while. And if there are any questions, I can I can take them up. No problem for me. I really appreciate you spending time with us today. So if there are any questions, further questions, feel free to pop them into the chat box for Mr. Ankit. But in the meantime, I would like to give some notice for the delegates for tomorrow's session. So there will be some technicality that we have to go over. So for tomorrow's session, we will be splitting into four regional groups, which we will be using four separate Zoom room. And we will also be using the chat C link that I have already mentioned earlier on today. So I would like to demonstrate them to you so you guys don't have any technical difficulty tomorrow. So firstly, I will be breaking out into four rooms randomly for today, but for tomorrow, it will be based on your regional groups, which you will be assigned and we are currently finalizing the information. But for now, I would like you to sort of like experience what it will be like for those who are unfamiliar with Zoom. So I will, when I press the breakout room, there will be four breakout room, which you will be assigned. And then you can sort of like chat and open your microphone and speak with everyone in that room as usual. And then when I end the room, everyone will be automatically ended and moved back to the main room. So I will demonstrate that right now. I will randomly assign for today, but for tomorrow it will be dependent on the regional groups that you are assigned prior to the session. So this will be what it will be like for the breakout rooms. So for now, you guys can sort of like just press join any breakout room. Sorry, I'm not sure if that's working. Let me try again. Yep, this should work now. So as you guys can see, that is how breakout room will work. So either me or Wendeli will assign you to your room based on your regional groups tomorrow. And all you have to do was just press join that group and then you can go and have an informal discussion in the separate breakout room. And when the time exceeded and the, there will be a pop-up session where it will say just like you had experienced that you will have 60 seconds to go back to the main room and you will all pop back into the main session. So that will be how it will look like tomorrow for the regional groups. And for the other 
thing that we have is about the ChatC group, ChatC link. So let me try and share this. So basically, this is what it will look like tomorrow. The team from the Vine Moon will probably send you something that look like this, which is basically the link based on each of your regional groups. So I think there will be four regional groups tomorrow. And you will have to click the chat still link, just like you are assigned, based on the finalization that we are doing tonight. So after you click the link, it will look like this. This is the Shatsi web page. So after you click the link, it will pop into this page. And all you have to do is type in the password that I had already attached in that page. And then you click enter room. So when you click enter the room, you will see a chat box that you can communicate with the delegates. So this purpose of Shatsi will serve both during the Zoom session and after the Zoom session, because after we close the breakout room, you wouldn't be able to contact with your fellow um, delegates in that regional groups anymore. So this is where ChatC come in. And then if you want to write a message, you can just click write message, type whatever. And then afterwards you send and everyone in that regional groups will be able to access. So the regional groups, this is, the technical aspect of what we'll be doing tomorrow. So that's probably it for now. Uh, yeah, France, do you have a question? Uh, just a small question, but uh, because I represent France, but when I check the uh, attendance list that you show, uh, France belongs to two regional blocks. So I'm not sure which blocks that I'm supposed to join. Oh. So our current roll call list isn't finalized yet. We'll finalize that with you guys tomorrow and we'll publish the finalized roll call sheet with the regional group that you should join. So we'll deal with that tomorrow. Are there any question with regards to either the technical aspect or anyone have any question for Mr. Ankit, feel free to ask. If not, we will adjourn the session. So see you all tomorrow at 8 a.m. CET time. Yes, but, Mr. Ankit. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, this was a great audience. Thank you for your patient listening and I'll be happy to do this again. But can you share the recording with me because I have to have it uh, uh, uploaded on the university's uh, YouTube channel. Oh, yes, I will ask the technical team and probably please. will forward the video recording to you afterwards. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was excellent uh, speaking and seeing you. This is the normally to see persons uh, on Zoom. Usually it's just black screens. So it's very informative. Please do kindly let me know if I can be of assistance to anyone. Uh, I'll share my my uh linkedin over here so that if you have any questions please feel free to direct them and uh, you can also join the society the jindal society of international law we host speakers on international law and international relations every every week and uh, we can add you to our our group which is which is now 600 members strong and you can uh, participate in it as well i've shared my linkedin you can message me and we can connect over there thank you everyone and i look forward to the recording which can then be uploaded on the youtube thank you everyone good evening from india